Good afternoon and welcome to this Welsh Strategic Dairy Farm webinar. I'm very pleased to be launching our fourth Welsh Strategic Dairy Farm, Penlech Bath. I'm Tegan Taylor, the Senior Knowledge Exchange Manager for the Welsh Dairy Team, and I have here with me today Matthew Jackson, part, part business owner in Penlech Bath, and Nick Parsons, Head of Dairy Development for AHDB, specifically working on our SDF project across the country. A little bit of housekeeping to start the day. Everyone is muted. Please try not to take yourself off mute. You'll end up getting a little bit of feedback. You can ask any question you like following the diagram on the right. All the questions are anonymous and you're more than welcome to ask, ask in English or in Welsh. Today's webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the AHDB website and on YouTube. The agenda for the day we're going to talk a little, a little bit about what an SDF is and why you should follow Matt Jackson's journey. We'll have an overview of Penleg Bach from Matthew Jackson and their KPI performance, and then we'll have an update from Nick Parsons on the Strategic Dairy Farm program. Strategic Dairy Farms aim to be showcase farms who are top performing within the industry. They always believe there's more to learn and more to achieve. These farmers are happy to share their stories with farmers to provide an opportunity to learn and provoke critical thinking. Strategic dairy farm hosts have the benefit from hosting large audiences on farm, people looking at their processes and businesses and asking challenging questions to always keep challenging the host's thinking. Our strategic dairy farms are always looking at developing their skill sets, businesses and performance. Please do ask lots of questions today this is just the start of Matt's SDF journey with us. And as they say, if it's worth, worth listening to, it's worth questioning until you understand it. I would now like to introduce Matt to give us an overview of his journey into the dairy industry and talk a little bit about the business structure of the farm. Thanks very much, Tegan. So um, I'm Matthew Jackson. And uh, the story, I suppose, is that I grew up in Manchester I'd always been going to North Wales camping on uh, a small sort of beef and dairy um, and sheep farm. And that's where that's where the passion started. Uh, we're milking 35 cows, a couple of hundred sheep and some beef animals. Um, I left school from Manchester at 15. Uh, I didn't have any qualifications, GCSEs and so forth. After lots of arguing with my mum and dad, eventually they said that I could go there for four months. And then I, that's where I went and I've never never really come back from Manchester since, apart from visiting family, and that's where they still all live. I met my fiance there uh, in Wales when I was 16. We've been together for 16 years. We've got three children, Seren, Shonin and Stefan. Um, I decided to go to New Zealand when I was 17 to learn how to shear sheep and press wool. Um, on from that, I came home and asked Reese Williams and David Wynn Finch for a job relief milking and so forth. Uh, I had a little 52C scooter and I was going around doing jobs on other, other farms as well. Um, after coming back from the sheep sort of journey, um, I decided that it was, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, it wasn't really um, a long-term thing for me and it wasn't sustainable for my body, I was thinking. And um, I came back and asked Reese Williams for a full-time job said that if I if I go back to New Zealand for six months um, to work on a low cost um, Jersey farm, 400 cows in Invercargill, he would give me a full time job. So that's what I did. So I went back there in June. I uh, did six months of calving and so forth. Came back and started working in Kevin and farm. I'm milking 12 to 1250 cows then. Um, he, uh, that was in 2007, 2008. I'd been there two years and in 2009, I decided to buy some heifer calves, uh, 20 heifer calves. I sold them the following spring with bullers. I bought some more. I'd been to the bank at this point to borrow some money, which they which they weren't willing at the start. And um, after getting myself an accountant and so forth, uh, they started to take more seriously. And over the next five to six years, I went into a share farming agreement with David and Finch. Other, other investments as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. 
did you want to then give us a bit of an overview of how uh, the business is structured in, in Penlake Park with your with your uh, partnership with uh, David? Yeah, so basically I was putting in 350 cows in which I had about 220 and I needed to borrow some money from HSBC, which they were very willing after seeing that the track record and my equity growth was growing quite quickly. Um, so I borrowed some money from them in order to buy some young stock and lift my cow numbers. Uh, we started the a conversion in 2013 in order to go into a 50-50 joint venture. And that meant that if I was putting 350 grand worth of in, uh, cows in there at, at grand apiece, David would match that with 350 k worth of infrastructure. And essentially, it, we've got one main account, Pensac Park Limited, where everything runs in and out. And at the end, uh, all farm work and expenditure goes in and out of that that one in, individual company. My cows are in my own limited company on my balance sheet, and the farm and assets are on his balance sheet. At the end of the financial year, any leftover or profit, if you like, is split 50-50 between us. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And how do you find that uh, partnership, Matt? I know you've got a few other partnerships that's obviously working for you at the moment. Yeah, well, it, it works really well. Um, the key, I think, to it is trust and integrity, good relationships. Um, we both have a lot of respect for each other, and I don't really sweat the small stuff, whether um, I feel sometimes if I'm willing to give give something to a member of staff, or if I say I go, if I, if I end up forgetting the bank card for the business, I'll pay on my own card and I'm not really interested in little things like that because I'm looking at the big picture. So I wouldn't I wouldn't essentially go back and reinvoice the business if you like. Now some people like it to be really strict and precise, but I'm not I'm not interested in it really. Um I just feel that it shows a lot more decency and it shows a lot more it's more ethical if you like, and David would respect that. Um so I'd worked for David for seven years previously. And Reese Williams, obviously. Um, Reese was my manager, if you like. He was a share farmer beforehand, and David was the landowner. So, um, I suppose um, the fact that I'd worked for him for so long, we, even though we probably didn't have a huge amount of um, a huge amount of getting to know each other through the time I was working with him, I didn't spend a load of time together. He knew what my goals and visions were, and he knew what sort of person I was, and I and I, I gathered the same from him giving opportunities to young people. So I knew that our values were very similar, and that worked well for us. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I was so keen to go into partnership with David. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. It sounds like you've got a really strong working relationship, which is obviously key when you go into business with someone. Um, coming back to Pinlick Park now, could you talk us a little bit through the conversion process and what that looked like? Yeah, so basically it's 240 acre farm. Uh, well, it was it was 92 hectares, so it was just short. We wanted to go in there at sort of four cows to the hectare, um, which which meant paddock sizes and so forth uh, needed everywhere needed fencing. Uh, like it was a beef and sheep farm previously, they milked a few cows there, but it, there was no tracks or real sort of infrastructure, if you like. So, uh, autumn, late autumn of 2013, uh, we got people in there, and I suppose I project manage it as a, if that's what you'd call it. Basically, I was a busy fool for about three or four months, but um, and learned a huge amount from it, and especially learned about managing people when people say they'll come and turn up and they don't, and you try and you try not to lose your temper. Um, so that was that was good for me and for personal wealth and stuff. So we started. We put about two and a half to three kilometres of tracks in with contractors. It was probably one of the wettest winters or autumns on wet, on record. Um, and I didn't really know the farm, so there was a lot to learn from that. Um, we also put in uh, a brand new twenty four forty eight Waikato milking parlour, very basic, same as what I worked in in New Zealand. Uh, not many electrics and not much to go wrong with it, really. Uh, it's a one-man band uh, with ACRs, so it simplifies the fact that one person can milk at any time of the year, and it just safeguards the business, in my opinion, that if somebody's off, there's always that person, that one person can always do it. Um, so we put that in with a collecting yard, 
Um, we also put a new ring main, 50 mil water ring main in with 28 inch troughs, one in each paddock. Uh, we had contracted in, we did most of the water troughs and stuff ourselves. Um, somebody came in and put the water pipes in for, for us. But the lessons we learned in that was without knowing the farm and without having a map of the farm for the drainage system, we had somebody in with a huge machine, uh, like a vibrating mole plow, and he went through a lot of the drains and we're still fixing that year on year. So that was something that's a massive learning curve and we changed the process while we're doing that now on. Um, the second year, we outwintered the first year and where we are, it's quite exposed, right on the edge of the sea, if you like, and on the thin, right on the edge of the peninsula. And um, Jersey and crossbred cows, which I bred myself, would hold the condition quite well. And they were doing, they were, and they were, they were doing, they were, they were managing on our winter, and even though the weather was quite harsh on them, um, they were on good quality silage with deferred grazing grass, um, old grass underneath them, which we were using this as a tool to implement the seeding for the following year. And we didn't have the outwintering facilities year one. Um, some we had some Irish Frisian cows as well. Um, some of those were melting a bit in the in the weather because they weren't used to it, the same as the little hardy sort of jerseys that we, I was used to. Um, so we yeah we changed things around a little bit. We started milking spring of fourteen, and uh, the farm was virtually totally set up by then, uh, apart from a shed and a silage plant, which we decided to do in year two. Okay, brilliant. And I really like that you touched on a little bit of uh, business resilience and things there as well. Um, and we'll get into more detail of what the farm is like and how it runs uh, soon. Um, you did mention your staff as well, and I can see a lovely picture of them just down there. Did you want to just introduce us to your farm team? Yep. So you've got Aaron, and Aaron's just been out working in New Zealand for two and a half years for the Guineas down in Southland. Um, so he's, he's worked for some of the best farmers in my opinion there is in New Zealand and the most progressive farmers there are in this system and then you've got Beth Ann and Beth Ann's basically straight out of school she started college and she wasn't that keen and she asked me for a job and uh, she's 17 she's been with us nearly a year and she's yeah technically very good uh, she's picking things up she's extremely clever and she seems just like she's showing a lot of willing and um, so really impressed uh, so if you like Aaron would be uh, to IC, to manager, if you like. I suppose I'm there overseeing everything. And that's where a lot of, that's a really important factor in this, that I've got to show my value as the share farmer, as the 50-50, because what's the point in David having me there if I'm not actually overseeing and making sure that the engine is running, if you like. So that's crucial that I'm constantly, regardless of what else I'm doing, I make sure that there's no way that that farm is losing production or it's going downhill at all because that gets in that gets noticed very quickly and i said i always said that i would never compromise the engine if you like which is pentac park where everything started from so i suppose i'm there trying to mentor staff giving as much advice as i can but i'm not there every single day um 24 hours because if i was i wouldn't need two members of staff there brilliant can we, um, if we move on slides now and just have a quick overview of what uh, Penlick Bark is, so um, uh, land area and things like that? Yep, so it was 92 hectares, it's now 100 hectares this year. We've uh, swapped some ground with a neighbouring farm, a friend of mine, and that extra eight hectares has bumped us up to the exact foot, which we always wanted to be, 100 hectare farm, which we felt was very nice, four cows a hectare. Uh, We've lowered that a little bit this year down to 370 probably milking 315 after a few calls and so forth and it's amazing what i've learned this year by dropping 30 to 50 cows off it it's made things much more easy to manage for, for both staff for, pe for people and for cows less pressure and also cash flow um so we've got 37 370 350 crossbred cows if you like Average live weight of 491 last time we weighed them. Um, so there's a few sort of Irish big regions there with not not as good of solids as what we'd have. And then we've got some real small 380 kilo jerseys, which are just which are pumping the solids out, if you like, and they're ideal for us. We're looking for cows that are efficient, they keep condition, maintain condition, they turn grass into good milk solids. 
um, and they don't get laid. They're fertile animals, and they're getting calf. This ensures minimal herd wastage, if you like. Averaging five and a half thousand litres of cow, and that's on between 700, 800 kilos of meal. Um, we've actually lowered that this year to 220 kilos of meal fed up to date, and we've done the very similar litres of it. So we're starting to question and reevaluate things. Um, it's all weather dependent, going out grazing mid Feb to November. Everyone loves to say that they're out January, February, but a lot of time it's nonsense. It's all weather dependent. We've had cows out in March and we've had cows out in January. The ideal is 300 days outside Feb to November, two months inside, and, it, and it's a dream like that. That's the, that's the perfect scenario. Brilliant, thanks Matt. I think it's about time we show everyone a little tour around the farm. Uh, so please uh, watch out for the video now so we can take a little tour. Wow, Matt, what an absolutely stunning place. I'm not sure if there's many other places as nice as that on that sort of sunny day. Um, I think it might be quite nice if we start to get into a little bit more detail on the farm uh, and we'll follow the video so you can see us in a, in a nice succession. So Matt, do you want to start by giving us an overview of the infrastructure on farm? Yeah, so basically we've got a, um, a shed with loose housing on about a third of it and the other two thirds are cubicles it's about 286 to 300 cubicles roughly um i don't know the exact number but it is about that uh, with 300 cows held in there anyway and then there's some um loose loose housing on the other side which we use for basically the first two months of winter it's all for sort of cows any low under condition cows uh, anything that needs a bit of attention or cows that won't lie in the cubicles um, and we so we put them on straw and later on we turn half of that into a calving calving pen and a place for calf rearing and this is quite nice and efficient because you're only carrying the calves for maybe 20 yards or so or so forth from the point of calving to where they're actually going to start you know, on colostrum and so forth. So that, that's quite nice and it makes it easier for staff. And uh, you can keep an eye on the cows calving while you're feeding calves as well, which is good. So the yeah, calf housing, uh, we basically put cubicles together, um, make pens of between five and 10 calves, depending on the, depending on how they're doing and how the route, how much room you want to give at that time or how many calves we're having. You know, we've had, We've had days of 40 odd calves a day there, and we've had days, and we get down to the start of calving on some years of 10 and 12 calves a day. So it just depends on the situation at the time. And everything is scraped from, from um, one end of the shed right the way down the cubicle passages and the passage from the um, straw shed straight down into a, a big slurry lagoon at the far end, which has enough slurry capacity for five months of the year. Um, we actually put that in and made it bigger without, it was unintentional really of having it so big, uh, but it's actually worked because the new rules that have come in for five months capacity instead of three, it's worked, it's worked quite well. Um, 
the yeah. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. And you did briefly touch on the uh, dairy parlor a little bit earlier. But did you want to just give us a bit of an overview? So remind us how many uh, how many cups it is and things. Yeah, so it's 24 48 white cattle parlor swing over. Uh, like I said before, it's a one man bang. Um, they are uh, like pig feeders, if you like, which are batch feeders. So you just pull a, pull a rope as you go down it and it drops one and then five, six, six, six. So it actually is quite, it works quite well for getting the cows in position. Um, and there's not a lot of pushing and so forth because they're fed in the lots. Um, yeah, we've got a 16,000 litre milk tank, which I could probably um, would prefer 20, but we actually bought all the stuff from a, uh, a goat farm, 4,000 goat farm that was that had, that had finished. Um, so that was quite good, and we got it on a good a good value rate. Like that's why we put all that in. Um, and we also have heat recovery to be more efficient and economical, uh, which came with it. And uh, we're on we're on single phase on the place, so we've had to put a split pot polyphase in. In order, so we sometimes have to stagger stagger uh, stuff in the parlour the electricity usage and requirement um, because we're a little bit low on power, if you like. Um, yep. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. We have had a couple of questions. The first one is, do you use any uh, precision tools on the platform? As regards, as regards to? Um, I, any precision technology? I guess you did say you've got a pretty simple parlour, so Anything else that you'd think that you use on farm? As regards as regards to like plate metering and stuff like that, would you say is that is that what people are getting at or? Yeah, potentially. If the person's online, uh, yes, in terms of plate metering, I see. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So we start the season. We're actually cutting and weighing grass. So I'll get information from Moor Park over in Ireland uh, sent over to us with the dry matter. Of the content of grass at that time of the year and it's not perfect and it, it's only a guide you always remember it's a guide the plate metering or the measuring grass of any type uh, because obviously with the weather things change day to day so it's a good guide to know you know roughly where you are and it gives you it gives you an indication of that um so i start this i start the season by cutting and weighing grass and with that information from moore park or chagas we use that in order to uh, do the equations calculate how many how many kilos of grass per hectare is uh, available for that number of cows at that time? Um, we tend to, with that information, we put it into AgriNet, which then breaks it down and makes it really simple for us. That if you've got so much per hectare in a so many hectare paddock, then you've got enough for say 0.6 of a day for 220 cows or 300 cows, so forth. So AgriNet is really helpful and it simplifies it all, especially for, for new beginners and starting. I then like the idea after that, we've been doing this measuring grass for a few years now. So we sort of, I'm quite confident as to, I'm confident to say that I'm happy with the measuring that I do personally. And if I can implement that and train the people's eye, all the people's eye that work, eyes that work for us to my eyes, then we can measure grass by eye for the rest of the season throughout. And the cows tend to tell you where you're at. So if they're a little bit short, you know, you're under measuring. If they've got an abundance of grass, you're over measuring a little bit or vice versa, whatever. So the idea is I start off to be specific when we are measuring by walking and pacing breaks out to give cows the exact requirements and allocations while we're calving because that's really important to make sure that we don't overuse the grass that we've got and find ourselves with a big deficit so that's an important part, part of the spring when we're calving but through the summer we're quite happy to train everybody's eye to that to mine and as long as we get that consistency you know this year for instance i probably haven't spent enough time with certain people and um one person i was i was struggling for time running around and I said, oh, well, you just measure. And it came back that we dropped a couple of hundred kilos of cover, average farm cover. So I took that naively and said, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put three days of silage in, a couple of bit of bits of silage. I measured myself the following week and I had to cut 17 paddocks of grass. And that ultimately then reflects on the back end of closing covers. So they are one, 
just one thing that I made a mistake on can have a massive impact long term. So that's that's important to make sure that when you're measuring that your eyes trained. Or well, the the very basic and simple one is you get a plate meter, and everybody uses the plate meter as long as they put the plate meter down enough times and in in the right motion, then you've got consistency. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. That actually leads us pretty nicely on the theory herd and your seasonal management. So if we can start by covering uh, a little bit around your spring management and how you do manage the um, the cows during spring uh, during calving. Yes, so basically they're on a diet of, depending on if we've got enough silage in stores and the quality of the silage and the season that we've just had, um, we sometimes feed some hay and some straw just on the barrier uh, with some sort of wet or good quality silage so they get a bit of a pick. So they're beyond sort of dry cow silage, if you like, through the winter period, the dry period. Um, so at the back end, they're in and they're on the best silage we've got, 10, 12 kilos of silage dry matter a day per cow. We, we sort of finish off milking on the 15th of December, which gives us about 60 days until point of calving, if you like. Maybe even about the 5th of December this year. We brought it forward or, forward or back, if you like, to about the 25th of Jan. Um, so they'd be on that, they'd be on a bit of meal and they'd be on good quality silage to the point of dry off. We batch dry off because I like things to be simple. Um, I don't want to be picking through and I'm not looking for the extra two or three litres out of those later calving cows because what I like to run is a simple and efficient system and the whole point I like I like the New Zealand system where they do things batches and um, um, it just makes my life easier and I'm not fantastic at technical stuff uh, and technology I just like it to be basic yeah so and what's those batches on Matt is that on body condition or calving date you know what what do you batch by if I could see that we had an issue with a proportion of the cows, then I would I would be doing it on body body condition more than anything. Uh, it wouldn't be on milk production um, unless an individual cow was completely dry and I and I put her off in the shed on her own paddock whatever. Um, it tends to, it tends to be all cows looking quite well. Um, I suppose the when I dry them off, the only thing I would do differently is I would put really fat cows on a on a poorer diet um, or poorer quality feed just to try and lose a bit of that off them. But um, I suppose if you're monitoring, you know, it's quite easy when you see cows every single day to to manage them and, and to actually realise, you know, oh, there's a cow there that needs a little bit of attention or there's a lame cow or whatever, you know. Um, so I've got, yeah, so anyway, we, we, dry, we dry them off in the batches. So basically within two days, everything's dry in one hit. Um, anything under 120 cell counts was on non-antibiotic because that's what people are pushing for. Personally, I prefer to use antibiotic for everything because I always feel that the, uh, a, a, um, a following, the, following, the following season, we've seen cell counts being higher as a result of using no antibiotic. I don't know, maybe this is just in my head, but that's the way I've that's the way I've found it so far. We've always run under a hundred cell count in Pentleft right the way through the season. Uh literally, uh, you know, it and it's and it's always been dead easy to maintain and manage. Whereas after after we went that first year, we only gave antibiotics to about excuse me, twenty odd cows or thirty cows. Everything else the following season we were on two hundred cell counts. We actually started to so I, I upped the rate of this I up I up the um, usage of the antibiotic again, and it's come back down to one twenty this year right through. So for me that's quite simple and and I like it. Um, at the point when we're told we have to do it every single you know every single cow, then I'll start doing it. Um, why you know don't break don't why fix something if it's not broken sort of thing. That's how I feel about it. Um, we're not using a lot of antibiotic anyway in the herd because we're not getting huge amounts of mastitis because of good management practices. Um, cows, basic. So I'll go back to your first question. I'm going. I'm rambling on here. Cows get dried off in their batches and then they go on like a hay or a low sort of uh, 10, 10, 10 and a half me sort of diet right through. Uh, monitor condition on them. If there is a few thin ones, I've previously used palm kernel to put a bit of weight on their backs. Um, 
with cows being indoor inside in housed inside it's quite easy to keep that condition on compared to what we've done previously with our winter and so forth um start calving day we start feeding them good quality silage two weeks just before they start calving basically to try and lift those energy levels a little bit it's not always the case nothing's perfect every year is different because some years we have rocket fuel silage and some years we have no bugger all you know and um, so the ideal is to start feeding them a good quality 11 me silage or plus 11 me plus silage to start lifting them lifting the energy levels and getting milk onto them um and we start calving on the 25th of jan typically calve 80 90 percent of the cows in the first six weeks and then the others straggle, straggle on for sort of the, the last four if you like um we the, the aim is the aim is 450 kilos of milk solids we're doing about 440 consecutively um i suppose it's in important to mention that there hasn't been a huge amount of consistency on this farm uh with milk production and cow numbers because i've run the farm at 350 and i've run the farm at 520 cows in order to fulfill other goals and other achievements with different farms and stuff so uh this is the right information that we've got in but i think there's so much more that we can actually have out of these cows if you like um like i said before average weight is uh three four nine one and uh we we are with u tree dairies i am trying to keep as many heifer calves and send off to contract rearing as many as possible in order to fulfill yeah. other other enterprises other other farms that we've gone into partnerships with um yeah that, that's brilliant thanks matt we have had a few questions um first of all is just what are your pre and post step regimes for milking and i guess that ties into mastitis management as well so during the time that cows are inside we are wiping cows pre prior to cupping cows and we spray with an iodine a strong iodine it's meant to be four to one but we're putting it about two to one um when we when we're actually when we actually got cows inside um in the in the summer when cows are clean cows get what the odd cow gets wiped but we're typically running on like a 20 back to scan right the way through probably a 25 back to one average through the year um yeah on it i'll be honest i'm not we're not the best at keeping cows um clean and we're not the best at um prep you know pre-milking prep uh during the winter period and it's something that we need to improve on and i think that's a lot of that's through spring calves in general in my opinion um because i don't feel that i'm really interested in milking cows in sheds because i like to see cows out in the paddock that's it and it's a new zealand thing and it's a mindset thing and i got it over that because with the way the seasons are going we are going to be milking cows more inside um but i'm picking stuff like that up and we are getting better year on year yeah brilliant thank you um what about any regular milk recordings and things for cell counts are you doing anything like that yeah we were herd testing and milk recording for the first uh, three years then we had a poor milk price on one year and i felt that we, we would drop that because cell counts were so good we were very low on yonis um we only had a few positive cases and i felt that i felt that cow you know cow health was very good and uh, cell counts we had milk quality was excellent so so i stopped for a year i thought that was what we could drop out and at the same, at the same time that's when we dropped out some vaccines as well because i felt we were a bit more established the herd was a bit more established um and it was more closed if you like because we put some groups of cows together and stuff so year three year four i felt we'll drop it anyway we missed one year and i started back and then we've had a previous milk we've had a four mil price last year and uh, i stopped again so it's a bit inconsistent but what what i have done was used all that information over those times we were doing it in order to draft the bottom 30 percent of our herd out and send down to another farm which we started up so it so it hasn't been it's so it's been valuable but really i need to do it every year i'm doing something with ahdb on that at the minute i think yeah perfect as part of our welsh scheme i believe matt so that's brilliant that you've uh, that you've got on the herd advanced scheme 
Um, another question here, just around milking routines. Um, do you go once a day or a 16 hour or anything towards the end of the season, or are you solely twice a day right till the end? Typically, it'd be twice a day right to the end. It depends. If I'm struggling, a couple of years ago, I went to New Zealand towards the end and we went on once a day to simplify things. So I suppose that was that was something more of a personal thing. But um, if cows are milking okay and we've got the feed, we'll carry on twice a day right through um, just because it makes sense financially. And in a way, you've dried a few, you know, you've got rid of your cull cows and so on. You've not got as many cows in the shed and it's quite easy to just whack them through the shed in an hour and a half. So it's not a big job. Uh, you're not using lots of power. Um, yeah, and because the parlours are fish, very efficient, I feel when you get to sort of that 10, 12 litres at the back end, I've tried the once a day thing before, and then you've got cows on cubicles that are letting a lot of milk out and stuff. I don't really like seeing it. Um, I've done it before. We go on once. I go on once a day typically for a week, if you like, and it try. I try and dry a few of those cows up, if you like, week, ten days. Um, but no, no specific. No. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And uh, if we just change slide, we get a beautiful picture of the herd. Um, and do you want to give us a chat about your vaccines? I know you did say that you've stopped a few, but when you were vaccinating or if you have restarted, what are the vaccines that you use? So we were doing it for everything, which was Lepto, BVD, IBR, Salmonella, uh, Rotavirus. Um, we, were, we were vaccinated for everything to make sure that for that first that first couple of years, we were we were hitting them hard and we made sure that they were safe and it was safeguarding us a bit. Um, yeah, I've been to lots of different discussion groups and there's and I've been to New Zealand on a few occasions since and Australia where the you know people have got completely different views and it's basically wait till the problem arises and hit it then. Um, or you know, go full go in hard full time, making sure you're safe. Um, I don't know, it's probably milk milk price related in a way that I've stopped a little bit and also I feel that the herd is quite safe um, because they're not bringing anything in essentially from anywhere else into this place um, as regards to other herds yeah we're going to start this year vaccinating for everything. Brilliant yeah. thanks man that actually leads us very nicely to just have a quick chat about your mating management and you've just mentioned you don't bring anything in so how do you manage the bulls or do you use bulls for AI or AI? Yeah, it's contradictory, isn't it? <laughs> Don't bring anything in. My next door neighbour, he uh, raised some bulls for us. He's on a, he's on the boundary with us, basically on the boundary with us. Um, he's not surrounded by any other cattle or anything. But um, yeah, he raised a few bulls from us, from ourselves, and I tend to use them. Um, it's something we need to look at as regards to inbreeding and things like that. Like I say, I'm not particularly technical uh, or interested in in breeding i like it to be simple again so we have a team of three to five bulls if you like and basically a big frisian cow would get a jersey straw um, a crossbred cow would get a crossbred straw and a jersey would get a frisian straw that's the way it tends to go uh, we have a couple of beef straws in the flask if, if it's something we don't want to keep off um, we'll do four weeks of AI or maybe four and a half weeks of AI because I think by the time we've hit just after four weeks we're getting bored and I'm the one picking cows nearly every well I am every morning uh, so the way I work it is I start 25th of Jan calving and don't get a lie in then till the, till the day we finish mating and I feel like I feel that simplifies things for everybody else because if the place is set up you've got all the important stuff out of the way and it's just milking cows so you know you've calved them your calves are off to the contract rearers and you you know that your cell counts are right because you've CMT'd every cow and um, they're very settled as in the milkers and um, the, you know that you're getting them in, you've got them in calf basically. After the six, after the four and a half weeks AI we put in a team of bulls and we rotate bulls uh, depending on and, and this is something else we rotate bulls depending on their um, temperament uh, because they get to about three years old and they, they start to get a little bit upset these jersey type bulls so again I feel I feel a bit high risk and I don't really want people in the pens and messing around with them so uh, 
I tend to put them in and, and let them do what they do. And it seems to work for us. Brilliant. Thanks, mate. That leads us very nicely onto young stock. So if we change slide, perfect. And can you give us a bit of an idea about how you manage your young stock and um, where they go to with your contract rearing? Yes, so we snatch calf cows the best we can. We have somebody coming in in the evening. We got away with it for the first couple of years, basically checking the cows 11 and 11 o'clock at night, midnight, back out by four. But what I was finding is we could, we could be going in the shed and having a lot of calves born. We could go in and there'd be 15 calves born. And they're all fine, nothing wrong with them. And we're getting away with that. And I was thinking, this is this is great, you know. But um, when we start wanting to match mothers to calves and stuff and be a, uh, be a little bit more specific on that, with wanting to keep the best, the cream in Penslack back and take the others out, it was important. Um, the fact we were using stock bulls with heifers as well, we, we were, and the heifers were front loaded, if you like. We were trying to make sure that we were getting the right heifers and matching cows, which I think we're quite good at now. So we, uh, we got somebody in to help at night and basically this guy goes around lambing sheep. Um, so he'll stop in and he'll, he'll check the cows for us every night for about 10 weeks, eight, nine weeks, um, which works well because it just saves that the risk of losing any calves as well. Um, and the cows are only got like an hour or two between nobody ever going in there and seeing them. Um, calves are snatched. Uh, they get between two and four litres of colostrum. That's dependent on if we are tubing or if we, we've now gone to actually teat feeding calves, the colostrum, but sort of one o'clock in the morning and you've got 10 calves. Sometimes you'll tube a few, whatever, if they're a bit, if they're a bit dry as well and they're not, and they're not keen to drink. So uh, that's, depend, that's dependent again and that's to try and simplify things and make it, if there's a member of staff checking them, you know for a fact, if they're not, if they're not gonna suckle, the member of staff, if there's a tube there, they will tube it. But if there's not a tube there, they might just say, oh, we'll feed that in the morning and it doesn't get its colostrum. So it's safeguarding things a little bit by having the tube, yeah. So they get they get two to four litres of the colostrum, majority would be three litres easily. Um, that colostrum is from pooled milk with a rotavirus injection. So we stopped doing the rotavirus for two years and we were having scours through the calves, but the same management principles, even cleaner and better. But um, we started back with the Rotavec and Rotavec Corona, and that's cleared up immediately. So that was something that we learned there, which was a good lesson. Um, then those cow calves are on uh, second milk and whole milk for about 10 days. And after 10 days, they go on to milk powder on a twice a day feeding regime. Uh, it basically works that we start the shed, we've got, say, 12 pens of calves that will hold 120, and as they get older, they get moved over, and when they get to near the door, they're out of the shed to another shed. They jump, we put them in a trailer and we send them to another shed, literally just across the road in the yards, the old sheds, and from there they go on once a day uh, until they're about, well, basically until they're 60 kilos, and they get weaned at 60 to 65 kilos off milk, um, then they're on to... Uh, meal so they're either 60 65 kilos or they're eating two kilos a meal i tend to do it on weight because i know i can see the weight managing the meat in meals quite difficult it's a lot more guesstimate, guesstimate work uh, so i like things to be i like to be able to see it so i weigh them I know for a fact they're in good condition look well and they get weaned off into another bun bunch uh, from there they're on meal in the shed meal and straw uh, sometimes a bit of hay, whatever I've got, or until they're 80 kilos and they go, then they go out to a contract rearer. So they get shipped off to a contract rearer uh, four or five mile away, another guy which is a mile away, another guy which is three miles away. Yeah, and, I, and then I rear 100 myself as well. So probably people are probably thinking, well, hang on, you've only got 175 calves, Where does, why do they all go to different places? Well, it's because with the other farms that we've taken on, um, we've taken on more contract rearers. And then what I do is try and match the size and places where the uh, points of, uh, I don't know what you'd say, breeding, if you like. I try and match the same sort of calves to them, them different contract rearers because we want to take different types of animals, as in Jersey, Jersey calves, crossbred calves and Frisian calves to different types of farms 
which uh, are easier to walk or flatter or like an old people's home type of farm. That, that's all the most calories in the bag. So they go to there and they're on meal until about 110, two kilos a meal a day and all grass. So they're 105 to 110 kilos. We weigh them every month and I go there to weigh most months. Uh, we monitor and main, uh, manage it that way. And then they get sent off onto just grass at 110 kilos. And that's where they'll spend, they'll spend their next 17 months on grass only until they come in point of carving. 15 months old, when they're being served, we put bulls in with everything for ease of management. But I think next year we're going to change that because uh, I'm trying to trying to improve breeding, I suppose, a little bit. Um, yeah, with what we're doing. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. Um, we've had a couple of questions. So, are you using sex semen on any of the herd at all? No. Um, down on the other farms, we're on our contracts. So I've changed that to some beef semen and some conventional, and then at the back end they're having they're having Jersey bulls because we know that Jersey bulls get them in calf for us. Tried beef bulls and stuff. It didn't hit our six week in calf rate because for two weeks the bulls worked well. The other four weeks we had we had a huge amount of empty cows, and that actually happened in Pensac. And I learned a, I learned a massive lesson there. As a share farmer, your cows are your equity. That's all you have. That's your asset. And why? What are we? Are we beef farmers or are we dairy farmers? And in my opinion, I was trying to get a very, very little, a small percentage of value out of a better quality car, but putting my business and my cows at huge risk with doing that. Um, so those cows that dropped off my balance sheet, essentially, they go to be culled and then the cull value goes back into the business because the cull value of cows uh, Cold cows and bull calves goes back into the main company, and that pays for the rearing of the replacements for the following year. You see, so as a share farmer, I just lost myself fifty grand there, and split that half of what was left with somebody else. Yeah, look at it as, as you like it. Maybe it's maybe that sounds ruthless, but it's it's part of it, and it's part of progress. When you're trying to get on and you're trying for minimal wastage, that was the wrong way to go for me. The fact that we don't have, we're not in a position where we have to keep these calves for eight weeks and we can actually we there is somebody that will rear them for us um to take on to bulls or people that will take them locally and try them on grass fed whatever we had people that were willing to do that um because it's not compulsory um i did we decide to carry on in Pensach to with conventional uh conventional semen because that suits my business and I like it. Um, sex semen. I've been I've been asking myself this question weekly. I've been talking with all different farmers from all over the place when I'm traveling or whatever. And it's different because you could say it's different, but not. I feel because we're trying to grow other businesses, I want as many heifers as I can get. If I was probably in Pentelac on my own, I probably and I was there every day on my own, I probably would try and upskill myself, better quality heat detection, making sure that I was writing numbers down every day, and I probably would go down the set semen route. But I just feel with the way that I'm doing things and I'm all over the shop, it this works better. Um, I certainly don't want to jeopardize my uh, conception rate. My in calf rate, my empty rate, but I feel that again, if it's not broken, don't why fix it, sort of thing. Um, so I've been put off sex semen because I've heard people that were having 65% conception rates, and I've heard of people having 25% conception rates, and I'm not willing um, to risk to risk it on a whim. What I really like in there about what you're saying is, you know, you're really evaluating your business all the time and it has to be working for you and where you're going to make sure that you're making the right decision. And I think looking at that level of your business constantly is really healthy. And it sounds like you're always challenging your thought process, which is just brilliant. Um, I am going to keep us moving along. 
Uh, I know there's some questions that we haven't answered, but we will come back for questions. Uh, so don't worry if your question hasn't been answered yet. Uh, Matt, can you just give us a bit of an overview of your grazing and forage lands and how uh, how that works? Yeah, it's 100 hectares. We've probably reseeded about 65% of that platform now over the years. We started off without no no paddocks reseeded. Um, and I always feel, and it's probably it's, it's probably an excuse more than anything, but it makes me feel better, that um, I always say that we never reseeded. Everyone else has done the conversion. They're all on full reseeds and we're not. And we're trying to compete with that. Um, over the years now, we've, we've managed to get to about 65% reseeded but actually that farm is very heavy clay and I feel that I'm probably going the wrong way to be honest um, I'm trying to put in all these sort of new hybrid grasses and things like that which which leave the sward very open whereas actually I should be farming my farm and focusing on the old the older pastures that are there which keep continuing to grow over the winter and they uh, they're very thick so the cows don't actually poach the same because in the winter, you know, you've got these three by three type grasses that um, it's very open, lots of clover, and it looks like there's nothing there all winter. Whereas I'm always reliant on the 35% that I've not reseeded. So I think I need to change my thought process on that. And maybe we grow a little bit less grass essentially, but it makes our management of, of the farm better. It suits the farm because um, every farm's different, isn't it? You farm your farm. Um, basically, yeah, we try and open up with a 27 or 12, 25. If we close up uh, with a 2000 average farm cover, which means that 1500 of that is classed a residual. So we're, we close up with 500 kilos a hectare available. We tend to grow five kilos through the winter, between five and 10. So hopefully if we grow five for 100 days, we open up on a 2500 cover, simple as that. And the idea is we've got a big bank of grass. If you look at it it's like a bank account, you've got a big bank of grass and you can slowly eat into that grass to get yourself back down to a fair residual of about 2000, 1950 by the day that we call magic day. And that's the 1st of April, hopefully, sometimes it's the 1st of May. Um, 1st of April, and that's when grass growth outweighs demand. Of what so basically if you need to be if your cows need 50 kilos growth a day and you're growing 60 over the farm then that's classed as magic day and um and that is when that's when you start really letting cows go and that's when you start putting milk in the tank if you like so we do we measure grass we measure grass every week and uh, we put it into agrinet we monitor it um and we manage it that way um do you take your team on those walks matt do you take them on the journey of the grass management so yeah yeah i i do and um yeah I, i'm honest um this year i haven't enough i've been i've been focusing on trying to get to work i've been coming home at nine o'clock at night and going on the quad to do it but um as long as it's done i don't care as long as that grass measurement gets done every week that's essential the night before last 10 o'clock at night with a head torch measuring grass. It's got to be done regardless. Um, and it's not ideal, but we've got other things going on as well. But ideally, I'd like to take them every week. And what I'm going to start for next season is that we that we definitely go together every week so we can talk on the way around and stuff. And on the other farms that we've got, I'll be walking one farm with a group of the other members of farms every week as well. I know they do that a lot in New Zealand and they get a lot out of it. And P plus the teams tend to integrate more. Anyway, we're going on to the third. So I start off, I've been using urea because P's and K's soil indices on the farm are very good. Uh, I think we're on 6.7 pH on average over the farm now. And other indices are threes and fours. There's the odd two there. Um, because all winter feed, because we've always been reasonably highly stocked, all winter feed is purchased in off, lo off local farms and from other sources, uh, hay or whatever else. So we're bringing a lot of organic matter and a lot of NP and K, uh, sorry, P and K in from out from outsourced. Uh, so that's been a lot, that's allowing us to use uh, urea and nitram all the way through the season, which basically I follow cows at 50 kilos a hectare for 10, like 10 um, applications, 10 to 11 applications to attend to use, you know, uh, 
200 kilos to 250 kilos a hectare of actual product, yeah, of actual nitrogen. Um, and that helps us to grow the grass that we require. We follow cow. I have actually bought a slurry tanker a couple of years ago, and we follow cows with that, um, which really helps. Um, and also, we put slurry out regular on regular times of the year with contracts. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And are you doing any cropping on farm and things like that? Any what? Sorry. Cropping. Do you put any crops no, in on farm? There's no cropping. Basically, if we can walk cows to the grass. Then that's what we do. We're not bringing we're not bringing grass to cows. We're walking cows to grass. Yeah, and so we have a lovely picture, I believe, of some of the contract rearing, uh, rearing farm that you yeah. use. Yes, yeah, so this is my this is my next door neighbour, Will's place, and he raised heifer calves for us. So uh, that's that's his credit goes to him. Um, kale and bales, kale and grass bales, uh, thirty acre paddock, and he'll winter a couple of hundred heifers in there right the way through, which simplifies it. Re, uh, fence down the middle, two mobs. Yeah, nice and easy. It looks like a brilliant setup there, Matt. It's a lovely picture. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Matt, we'll, we'll move on now to the optimal dairy systems KPIs. Uh, these KPIs have been created by AHDB to set a clear measure of targets so you can benchmark your performance and identify areas of improvement. There are six key technical KPIs uh, that differ for all year round carvers and block carvers. And there are three financial KPIs that are sort of the same for all systems. You can see on the slides that they're broken down to uh, excellent, good, and average performance. And we can see on the right hand side that Penlet, where Penlet Bark sits in all of the KPI areas. Uh, Matt, I know that you do a bit of CFP work and uh, technical KPI work with your discussion group. And I'm just wondering if you can have a quick chat about what they mean to you and benchmarking your business. Um. The financial side, are you talking or are you talking on both? Both. Yeah, well, it, it's important. It's important. Oh, there you. Thanks. For it. It's important for us to be monitoring where we are at all times and um, comparing ourselves with others. Sometimes difficult to compare yourself and sometimes you're a bit afraid to go to a discussion group and try and compare, especially if you know that something's not fantastic, but it's best to go along because you always learn something. And there's always people in there that are, that are better than you. And it's always good to go and ask that question and never be afraid to, and still put your figures up because you're always trying to trying to get better and improve on it. Um, so never be afraid of that. Um, majority of people in these discussion groups always want to help individuals and better people. Um, and that's the sort of network that we're in. If you like, they're always willing to share their uh, KPIs, not only on um, practical KPIs, but financial. And that's a massive, massive part of the discussion group, which makes us, makes our business thrive, if you like, and makes us tick. Um, because if you can see that somebody else is producing milk for cheaper than you, you want to go there and find out how and why they're doing it. And they're willing to tell you how and why and you know, get in there. Um, so, yeah, as, as performance, uh, cows and heifers calves, 83%. Yeah, we're always somewhere around that, if you like. Um, quite happy with it. There's obviously, we there's room for improvement there. Um, herd replacement rate, very difficult one to monitor with what we're doing because some, some years I'll bring in 130 heifers and I'll get rid of poor performing cows or some years I'll bring in none like this next year, we're bringing in none and we're lowering stocking rates. Um, and that's because of because we need we need heifers elsewhere as well. Um, solids output per hectare, you want me to run through faster? Um, no, no, that's no, pretty no, we've, we've got the, that your cows and heifers calved within the first six weeks. And I know you touched on that, which is at 83% at the minute. Um, but this is like one of the really important KPIs for your business, right? Because you're driving uh, driving this forward to help with your other other farm enterprises as well. Oh yeah, it's crucial. So we want cows, we want cows in calf and days in milk, and that's it. And making sure because when you the crucial part for me is to keep that cow calving at the same time every year because every time she misses a cycle and with poor poor fertility management or 
um, what's the word, a heat detection. Every time you miss a cycle, that cow moves forward. So she moves forward to the end of April, uh, end of Feb. Then she's moving into the second week, third week of March. And all of a sudden, she's out of the system and she's worth nothing. Because on a balance sheet, she'd be worth 1,200 quid. And on, on a hook or sold in sale or whatever else, she'd be three or 400 quid to me. You know, so that's that's key to us getting cows in calf and days in milk. Crucial. Brilliant. Thanks Ned, for expanding on that. We um will expand on the next one as well. So we've got um another KPI to have a have a good look at, which is the full economic cost of production. And Matt, we hear all of the time in the industry that cost control is really key, um, and that we can um withstand flux in milk prices to an extent if we just keep focused on our cost control. And I know you yourself have been quite challenged in recent times with milk price, but you've still achieved a brilliant figure. And I know that you might be a little bit disappointed by it, but on industry average, it is exceptional. Uh, so can you give us a, you know, explain to us how you do keep focused on costs um, and how you manage it practically with your farm team? Yeah, I suppose um, I'm not, I'm not the best at at the getting the farm team involved with costs at the moment i think it's a bit too much especially for for one of them um because she's new to it you know it's too much it's it's i don't want i don't want to um her overwhelmed with me trying to put too much on her because she's learning so much and uh it's some of that i need to it's some of that i need to involve them more with um i suppose it's time really it's my it's my fault because it's a time thing um, the full economic cost of production pence per litre, 23.4 pence. Well, we've been at 16 pence and we've been at 25 pence in Pentec. 23.4 is probably a result of um, not having enough silage, being a bit overstocked because I'm trying to trying to improve on, do stuff on my other things. So that's, that's hit it a little bit. And also we had stuff like... Uh, inefficient things like we did a lot of drainage because of the damage that was done years ago and that came out of the farm um also we split the silage pit with concrete walls for twelve thousand quid and when you start doing stuff like that all of a sudden that cost of production goes up quite quickly and uh, i remember when i got into farming and someone said to me four four legs make it pay and four wheels will take it away and i absolutely stand by that because I've only got one tractor, one skid steer, yeah. and we've got a mower, and we've got a tanker. And I cut, I'm the tractor, uh, sorry, the skid steer and the mower is owned by Pentlac Park, yeah. And the tractor and the um, uh, tanker is owned by my own company, and I contract it back. And it absolutely kills me paying that monthly, monthly uh, amount on it, or any damage or tires or anything. I hate it. Um, and I would say, it's, and this is this is personal preference, but that's what makes, that's what keeps you under that twenty four that twenty four pence, if you like, by not buying stuff that's depreciating assets and focusing on stuff that are depreciating assets, and focusing more time instead of sitting on a tractor uh, or repairing stuff or focusing on cows and grass. So that's that's as basic as it gets, and it's and this is as abrupt as it gets as well, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. I always remember someone telling me if they can sit in their lounge and hear absolute silence, those are the days they're making money on farms. So uh, I'm really pleased to hear that you've uh, said the same message. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break now, Matt, because you've been absolutely exceptional and I can see a bunch of questions coming in. So I'll give you some time to grab your, grab your breath before we uh, continue with the questions. Uh, now, for everyone listening, if you want to continue with uh, with Matt on his strategic dairy farm journey, um, if we just change slides, you'll see where he is looking to improve. So Matt's areas of improvement are around growing more high quality grass, improving his milk yields and quality. Uh, he wants to maximise his cash out of the business to uh, maximise his capital repayments and creating and replicating efficient farms. And I just want to finish off this portion of the webinar with a quote that Matt said to me, and I think it sums up perfectly Matt's passion and drive in the industry. And I think it's a little bit of Matt's why and why he does work so hard constantly. And he said to me that he wants to show you that farming and agriculture is a good industry to be a part of and help incentivize, incentivize young individuals into it. 
I think that's absolutely fantastic and it's something that we're all striving for. And so Matt, I hope you don't mind me sharing that, that direct quote from you. Um, as I said, we're going to give Matt a little break now, but start filtering your questions through because Matt will come back uh, pretty soon to answer any lasting questions. I'd like to introduce Nick Parsons uh, again to everyone. He is going to give us an update on the Strategic Dairy Farm Network across the country and also where we're heading with Strategic Dairy Farms at the moment. Thank you, Tegan. And uh, yeah, thank you, Matt, uh, especially. Uh, I think the pieces that I took out of that, uh, and uh, there were many, but uh, the trust and integrity that he's working within his, uh, within his agreement within the share farming, um, the keeping it simple. But I think for someone who's trying to keep it simple, the detail that Matt has in his head is, uh, is truly impressive. And I think uh, doing a brilliant job. Uh, I think the idea and, and consideration of fresh ideas and looking for those fresh ideas through discussion groups and travel and uh, the thought of encouraging the uh, team development and his next, what he's doing next, what he's thinking of uh, for the next year, the next season. And uh, just asking those questions and, and continuing to challenge himself, great. So uh, thank you, Matt. I'll uh, just touch on uh, the strategic, the wider kind of picture of that. Thank you. And so from a farm excellence platform, and I've used this slide a number of times, but from the uh, farm excellence platform, which is the wider HDB group of farms that uh, are held, and we have strategic dairy farms uh, there across the sectors. We have uh, farms across the country, totaling nearly 100, that are working in a similar way to our strategic dairy farms. That 16 is now 17 from today with Matt's launch. Uh, up in the top left hand side of Wales there, top uh, northwest uh, side of Wales, uh, that, uh, that star there will now change to uh, identify them as a spring block carver. Uh, we've got uh, that uh, identified farms uh, which are showing, uh, showing the autumn block carvers and the all year round carvers which we aim to have an even spread across the country. Uh, we are launching the other White crosses uh, on there are farms that are beginning, uh, coming through an audit process, and and uh, through the autumn you'll you'll hear about the uh, the new launches. So we will aim to have 25 uh, by around the end of the year, and uh, hopefully uh, sooner or later we will be able to get uh, with COVID, uh, we will be able to get back out onto farm and uh, be able to uh, deliver both webinars and continue the digital piece of the platform but also uh, be able to uh, get farmers back to uh, talking to farmers and talking to the strategic dairy farmers which i know they're all looking forward to immensely thank you so whilst we wait to uh, to get back out on farm our uh, website is uh, giving you details of all the different uh, farms, all 17 have a separate page. Uh, you can go there to uh, see the detail behind, uh, behind that farm, what they're trying to do as Tegan just reflected on Matt's targets for the three years that he'll become uh, the, uh, the newest of the strategic farms. Uh, a number are coming to, uh, to the end of that three year period next year. So worth considering uh, if you're interested, then uh, make contact with myself through HDB or your knowledge exchange managers across the country, uh, including Wales and those two red stars back on the previous uh, in the south uh, southwest of uh, Wales are areas where we're definitely looking for new strategic dairy farms. So worth considering if you're interested in talking around the opportunity, then please do make contact. So the website's a good place to go to uh, follow the story of each of the strategic dairy farms. You'll find farms that are uh, suited to your, your type of production, your type of system. But I think as uh, I hope you realize today with Matt, that there's a lot to learn from each of the farmers, irrespective of what system they're running, that they are truly driven farmers who want to uh, share their knowledge, but also learn from yourself and the questions are much appreciated that are coming in uh, today. Thank you. So Tegan's mentioned the optimal dairy systems and uh, a big part of what we're trying to do with the strategic dairy farms is very much look at these uh, optimal dairy systems, the KPIs, the key performance indicators that we and the industry chose 
uh, those nine uh, KPIs to be the most important ones for people to measure. Uh, we, there are industry targets that are set and those KPIs uh, are now, we hope, uh, becoming uh, even easier to, uh, to measure, both against the uh, strategic dairy farms. So if you go to the website, each of the strategic dairy farms has their own KPIs uh, flagged up on their page. So you can compare yourself to, uh, to those, uh, those strategic farms, but also uh, to be able to benchmark against targets uh, as with Matt's, uh, Matt's figures before. They're split into two systems, the block carving and the all year round. So uh, it, it's uh, uh, broken down into uh, targeting the kind of system that you're working and setting you uh, challenges, setting you targets to, uh, to work against. So what I'm just going to touch on now is the uh, KPI Express tool. It's new. It's now on the, uh, on the website and it's uh, giving everybody and those people who haven't in the past measured themselves against uh, both their, their neighbours uh, within a discussion group or uh, uh, comparing year on year, the uh, KPI Express tool will give you that opportunity to uh, understand your own business performance as Matt does in such an intricate way and drill down into those areas where you can measure. Thank you. So the tool, uh, it uh, will let you choose up to 10 production and business KPIs. Uh, the uh, milk from forage is split into two, that's where we get the 10th, and uh, tailored to all year round and block carving, as I said. So you can either enter a KPI value if you know it, or you can use the uh, Express tool to uh, calculate uh, that uh, KPI value by putting in uh, uh, just a small amount of data, uh, registering on the website, small amount of data, you can start that KPI uh, measurement through the AHDB website. So I think it's, it's, it is new. Uh, we've had FarmBench for a while now, but uh, that first stepping stone to uh, people starting to measure their own businesses is very much this KPI Express tool. So it will allow you to measure one. If you uh, want to put a couple of bits of data in, it will give you the answer and give you that KPI to measure against others or you can uh, then start to stretch uh, through to the all nine of the different ones that you can measure, both in production and technical KPIs, but also the business KPIs, the uh, cost of production uh, that Matt was referring to as being uh, as, as important. The address is down there at the bottom, but uh, if you haven't managed to capture that, don't worry, we will send you the email at the end of the uh, session today that comes out and that uh, that email address, sorry, the uh, website address will be uh, will be on that uh, the link to that uh, KPI Express tool. Thank you. So you can uh, understand why it's important to measure. You can uh, understand uh, the way to uh, to do that. You choose the way the uh, uh, you you target area. So the twelve months that you're going to uh, uh, work to find the figures for that. Uh, you can record the same KPI over time, and so consequently you can uh, year on year measure your own business, but more importantly, uh, you can uh, measure against the uh, targets for the industry. You can see the calculation of each KPI, which I think is key that you understand why and how that uh, calculation is being worked out, and then you can enter specific numbers uh, relevant to those uh, KPIs that you've, uh, you've selected to, uh, to choose from. Thank you. So this is how it looks as it did on mats. Uh, you, can, you can look at a number of different ones. And as I say, you can, you can look at just one or you can look at many. So I encourage you to go and have a try, have a look at it and, uh, and start that benchmarking journey. Uh, you can run your own bespoke report. And I think the interesting and, and uh, important part about the uh, development of this tool is that that little box in the middle allows you to uh, compare against in industry targets and so forth, but also find out how to improve your performance. So that box in the middle will, will give you links and direction through to uh, helpful, helpful articles uh, that HDB have developed in the past. Uh, and, and lots of different uh, uh, digital digital uh, work. So it may well be a video, 
with someone talking about it, it may well be uh, one of our guides uh, uh, that can uh, that can direct you. So I, I urge you to go through to the KPI Express tool and uh, have a look and uh, start that journey of uh, of benchmarking and using KPIs to help your business. Thank you, and back to Tegan. Thanks very much, Nick, and for that uh, run through of the KPI tool. It is fantastic, uh, and uh, Penelope Bark is all on there as well, which is which is amazing. Um, we're coming back to Matt now. We've got two technical questions, Matt, and two business questions to go through. Um, the first one is, uh, as Matt is buying in all his silage and hay, uh, how does a dry summer such as this one or 2018 affect your margins? Dry summers would not affect Penslach Bach in the fact of grass growth because it's a heavy clay farm, so we can take advantage of that. I suppose what I would what I would do first thing I would do is I'd um, get rid of any passengers, so any cows or any young stock, anything that I felt was affecting uh, us growing grass, and I would try and be proactive in the fact that um, if I felt that we were really short of silage and it wasn't to be had, I would ask and ask around to find somewhere else to winter some of the cows, or I suppose one of the benefits of having the other farms now. If they've got a if they've got a surplus, I can take cows to it, or I can take silage from them. Um, it just gives me more options. But to get to get to to get to it on a financial level, when we were running 510 cows, 520 cows in 2018, for me to fulfil my goal and my ambition of running of buying another farm, I cost the business about 100 grand in purchasing feeds, um, which is hard to stomach. And David was. Um, part of this, he knew what was going on, and basically, if we hadn't have made the money and I didn't manage to get it back, and we hadn't have got that silage back in, um, I yeah. would um, compensate the business for it. Um, at the same time, we were on, uh, we David was doing something what he wanted to do, so there was compromise there from both sides. So, uh, but but from a business point of view and a risk risk point of view. Um, that's why I suppose I'm looking more at dropping stocking rates a little bit because I feel that we're just becoming takers and we're just taking any old crap silage at top top dollar from everyone. So it's something that I've re-evaluated this year and with having the other farms, I've noticed that by dropping a stocking rate, it's actually making the business uh, a nicer place to be, a nicer environment to be in for cows and people and me and mentally as well for me. Um, not chasing your tail the same, but yeah. For I think a, diff, a difficult a difficult time like that is bound to put, you know, it's bound to be hard on cash flow. Yeah, I think that's brilliant, brilliant, Matt. And I, the thing that keeps coming up for me um, during this webinar is just that you're looking at everything and you're constantly looking at your business resilience, and that is fantastic to hear. Um, and the fact that you're looking at that lower stocking rate to give you a little bit more options uh, is just a fantastic business decision, I think. Um, the next question that's come in is around uh, grass mixtures um, and hybrid lays uh, for more silage production and if it's something that you'd be looking at. So it is, and we rent some silage ground that we are in control of full time. And I've been putting these three by threes in there. Um, I suppose it's further away from the platform, the milking platform, and it's out further to carry. Um, it's lower on P's and K's, and I'm probably not putting enough back into it, to be honest, because I'm trying to focus more on the on the milking platform. So, yeah, we're trying that. Um, but to be honest, the silage that we're buying is quite good quality stuff from neighbouring farms, so I'm not focusing on, I'm not really looking at um, implementing that Maybe, maybe I should be. Look, we need to get better at growing good rocket fuel sort of silage. But one thing I'll say on it is I'm no expert on seeds and grass. I've not got any qualifications on it. I'm no expert on fertilizer and crap at it. But what what them people out there are there for is to advise me on what's right and wrong. Not to sell me, not to come and sell me stuff, but to advise on the right. If, you, if you, your um, grass growth is this much uh, per year, or your fertilizer or your P's and K's are, are down here, what do I need to do to get it back up here? And it's they can't really pull the wool over your eyes and sell you a load of product because 
it's not that difficult to work out if if they're trying to do that. Yeah, as a salesman through the door, if you like. So everything's quite self-explanatory when you ask these people and you do your soil samples and so forth. It comes back on a piece of paper and you can work it out from that. And that's what I use them people for. Because I'm I'm hopeless at I'm hopeless with graph. You know, you don't have to be an expert in everything you're doing. Um because there's other people out there to do that for you and that's what they get paid for. Brilliant. Thanks for that. I think that's a, a really good advice as well. Um Matt, I've got two two business questions for you. Um if you were to give someone one piece of advice about converting a new conversion, what would it be? That's a, that's an interesting question. Um <laughs> be prepared. Be prepared. Um to monitor your costs, to come across things that you didn't think you were going to come across, uh, to overspend uh, and so overborrow. And even if you overborrow and you don't overspend, you've got a bit in the bank, which is a nice safeguard. Prioritize your jobs and be proactive as regards to get things ready and prepared for when your builders turn up. Because you don't want 10 builders standing around your yard charging you because you start getting frustrated and then you fall out with people. Um, be prepared in getting pipes laid and so forth for when the track the track laying man turns up, that they never get off their machines and they never standing around. Um, be prepared in the fact and keeping to keep people happy. What we do with all the conversions we've done, we feed everybody, feed them as much as they want. Uh, cost a couple of grand for the conversion. But people are happy and they come back. Um, prioritize your jobs according to weather, because the weather is your most your most expense and most a cost effective thing, uh, or, or most costly thing while you're doing any conversion. So if you get so for instance, if you get tracks laid in the middle of winter, um, we did one in 15 days ourselves, all hired machines cost us about 11 quid no no about 12 quid a meter to lay a track and it was 15 days um we did another one whereas it was lovely a lovely sunny day and it cost us eight pound a meter and we did the other one then that was even nicer weather on better quality ground with better quality stone it was costing like five well it, it, it was three pound on a meter but nobody believes me on that so but i'm telling you how it was anyway <laughs> weather the weather is exactly the same as farming. The weather influences everything when you're doing a conversion and it can put 100, 200 grand on that end result very, very quickly. So be prepared. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. So be prepared and keep everyone with a full belly. Uh, I think we can all remember that. Um, and the last question we have time for today um is if you were to give one piece of advice for someone that was going to go into a share farming agreement what would it be advice to go into a share farming agreement yeah integrity is the key thing if you haven't got a load of cash and if you haven't got if you haven't got a lot of money um and i don't know if Bryn edmonds or Elian jones are watching but they're the ones that have basically had trust in me and faith in me right the way through from HSBC there, um, right the way through from the start of my progress. And I always thought that capital was the most limiting factor, but it, but it's actually the least, in my opinion, now, because what, the, what they're looking for is people with, that are um, honest, um, yeah, track record, uh good integrity they've never put they've not got a bad name people haven't got bad things to say about them because ultimately every if you if you if you've got a bad track record or if you've got bad integrity or if you're rude to people or um you have you're not respecting others and people pick up on that ultimately that reflects on everything else that you do and the people surrounding you um so if I, yeah, you want to get to, basically, I would say you want to get to know the individual. Uh, first of all, you want to go and try uh, different aspects of farming uh, and uh, different industry, the different type of industries 
to be involved in in farming as regards to um, poultry, beef, sheep, whatever, whatever it is, um, and networking to find the right individual that will that you can make something last with. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but it's all about relationship. Yeah. So it's finding the right person that you feel comfortable with, but making sure that it's something that you want to do long term. And that's what I'm saying about going and trying different aspects in the industry, different place, different types of farming, because it's crucial. You don't want to put five years, invest five years into it and think, shit, I don't want to be in this and get out. You know, it's, it's like, you know, falling at the last hurdle, if you like. Um, and remembering that once you're in it, it's a long term thing. You know, you're not, it's not get, get rich quick thing. You're getting in it and it's long term. And you've got to put the hours in. Um, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, you make your own bed and it's not bloody comfy. And but you've got to lie in it. And it's understanding that and not, and not blaming anyone else. Look, I'm rambling on about all the little things that I come into my head, what I think are important when you go into a joint venture. And it's like I said before, with things, um, looking at the big picture and not letting little things bother you and not letting little things bother that, you know, the really important things um, are what are important. The, re the small things as regards to doing a bit of drainage on the farm and it's cost two and a half grand. And half of that, half of that should be paid by the landlord. Sod it. It doesn't matter about the, the fifty, you know, the twelve hundred and fifty quid or whatever it is that's owed to me, because long term, you know, that's probably worth a hundred grand to you, um, or more. And uh, it's always an interesting one for me for people trying to get into share farming or looking for opportunities. Was myself with Reese Williams when I worked for him. I was constantly asking him every week. I wanted a, a pay rise because I was looking at the financial side of it. I was always looking at money. And uh, Reese used to say, "Look, if you can afford to put food on the table and you can afford to run your car and you've got a good job, you've got a missus, whatever, then don't complain about the money because your opportunity will come." And I'd go home and say, "What a load of nonsense!" And this, that, and the other. But it's absolutely true, one hundred percent, that if you're showing willing um, and you're investing time into somebody else's business and you show it you uh, look after it like it's your own you look after those cows like it's your own it does get recognized and your opportunity does come brilliant thank you so much matt i think we've had so much out of the webinar today and so much out of you and it's so nice to just have you uh, here and just having a really honest conversation um with us i'm really sorry to everyone listening but we are going to run out of time we uh, will summarise the webinar uh, on an email and I'll ask Matt to summarise some of his uh, answers into a, some bullet points so that we can put that into the email as well. Um, I just want to draw your attention today to the fact that this webinar is jointly delivered with Farming Connect and Farming Connect have a brilliant dairy support scheme. Uh, they have one-to-one -one surgeries uh, ranging from legal advice to staff management that you can always be a part of or uh, or contact somebody about. Reese Davies, uh, Simon Pitt and Gwynan Evans are the technical officers um, and I'll make sure I circulate their details as well if you can't catch them today. We can just flick over slides please. Um, Farming Connect also have funding at the moment for animal health clinics, that's for animal health testing as well as one-to-one -one vet advice which you can always access by contacting Farming Connect or speaking to your vet and they have three webinars coming up uh, around uh, management uh, and prevention, uh, soil quality and heifer rearing. So I would encourage you to book on uh, those webinars if they are of any interest to you. Uh, I would like to just take the opportunity to thank everyone again today and to especially thank Matt. As I said, this is the start of Matt's journey. And if you'd like to follow it further, you can find all of the information about Penlake Park on the AHDB website, as well as any of our other strategic dairy farms. Again, we'll send around a summary email today uh, so you can have a summary of everything that we've discussed. Please look out for all of AHDB's upcoming webinars, and we're going to leave you today with one last look around Penlake Park. Fjolk and Vald, thank you very much. Goodbye.